The Egyptian God series are a set of cards focused around three of the most powerful duel monsters ever created in the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime and manga. Obelisk the Tormentor, Slifer the Sky Dragon, and the Winged Dragon of Ra. In the anime series, these cards were actually so powerful that anybody who had anything to do with the creation of them actually died a most painful death. The only exception to this was Maximilian Pegasus, who decided to create them all by himself using his Millennium Eye's powers to protect him. However, after the cards were made, Pegasus still feared their devastating power, and so decided not to release them to the mass public. Instead, he sealed them away, hoping they would never be discovered. Of course though, if we flip it into the real world, we did not heed Pegasus' warning, as there are thousands of Egyptian god cards everywhere. Even fake ones! I actually have three fake ones myself. <laughs> oh my god, what have we done? Did we not see what happened to Odeon when he used a fake god card? The man got struck by lightning! What have we done? Anyway, interestingly, the Egyptian gods came out in two different waves. The first was their illegal novelty forms, resembling their anime equivalents. These cards couldn't be used for tournament duels, but you could play them against your friends and give them the broken anime abilities from the show, which were always a little bit vague, so you'd always get a couple arguments when you played against your friends, but still pretty fun. The second wave was their official legal prints, giving them balanced real-world effects. However, while the new New Obelisk and Slifer got to take their effects from some of the Yu-Gi-Oh! video games released at the time, and thus had their effects remain almost identical to the anime, the Winged Dragon of Ra unfortunately took a massive nerf to all of its abilities, since now it can't be special summoned, it doesn't gain attack equal to the combined attack of all the monsters used for its tribute, and its ability to dump all your life points into the monster's attack got reduced to all of your life points but one to everything but a hundred. Doesn't seem like a massive difference, but the Yu-Gi-Oh card game, one extra attack point can still get over a monster, so it's a shame. And unfortunately, again, all three of the Egyptian gods lost their immunity ability that they had from the anime, which in my eyes meant that they could no longer be seen in good right as unstoppable gods, that you would honestly fear if they ever hit the field. Instead, they just became regular strong-ish monsters. Anyway, how about we take a look at each one of the god cards as well as their support cards, starting with Obelisk the Tormentor, known in the Japanese as Giant God Soldier of Obelisk. First wielded by Seto Kaiba in the series, Obelisk's illegal card text reads, The descent of this mighty creature shall be heralded by burning winds and twisted land. And with the coming of this horror, those who draw breath shall know the true meaning of eternal slumber. God, that's awesome. His legal version's effect reads, requires free tributes to normal summon, cannot be normal set. This card's normal summon cannot be negated. When normal summoned, cards and effects cannot be activated. Cannot be targeted by spells, traps, or card effects. Once per turn, during the end phase, if this card was special summoned, send it to the graveyard. You can tribute two monsters, destroy all monsters your opponent controls. This card cannot declare an attack the turn this effect is activated. So how about we start with this monster's name? Obelisk is the only one of the three Egyptian gods not to actually be named after an actual Egyptian god. Instead, his name is derived from the word obelisk, which is a giant stone pillar that rises to the sky with a pyramid-like shape at its peak. Obelisks were a prominent part of Egyptian culture though, as they were used as a form of religious monument, depicting a ray of sunlight piercing the clouds and then hitting the very earth. They were usually placed in pairs at the entrances of ancient Egyptian temples. In the Yu-Gi-Oh! GX series, Seto Kaiba created a dueling school called Duel Academy. As part of the school, there are three dorms that elicit the members' skill level in dueling, and as such, it also determines how good their living conditions are. These dorms are Slifer Red, Ra Yellow, and Obelisk Blue. As Seto Kaiba was the wielder of Obelisk the Tormentor, you can imagine which dorm he made the best storm. The card artwork for the illegal Obelisk the Tormentor is from Yu-Gi-Oh! Duelist Duel 89, the god of the Obelisk, 
where Kaiba is standing with its materialized form. Obelisk also has an alternate artwork, which was derived from how it looked in the dawn of the dual arc of the manga. It took the same form as well in the Yu-Gi-Oh! R manga, specifically when Yugi would use Divine Evolution to upgrade Obelisk. Unsurprisingly as well, this card has inspired two counterparts, a Wicked God counterpart called the Wicked Dreadroot, and a Sacred Beast counterpart called Raviel, Lord of Phantasms. Out of all the Egyptian gods, Obelisk is the only one to have base, attack and defense points written on its card, as well is the only one of the Egyptian gods that does not take influence from a dragon in terms of appearance, as well is the only one to not be summoned in the Yu-Gi-Oh! GX anime. Finally, Obelisk's attack name in the anime is called God. God Hand Crusher in the Japanese, which was then watered down to Fist of Fate in the English and then watered down again with Fist of of Fury. His effect to increase his own attack to infinite and basically make him go Super Saiyan was called Soul Energy Max, with its powered up attack being called God Hand Impact. Oh, and it's probably worth mentioning as well, the only one of the three gods that got a summoning chant that had to be recited before its summon was the Winged Dragon of Ra. This is because it's a higher class and it needed like an extra level of security to make sure nobody used Ra to, you know, destroy stuff or whatever. Obelisk didn't get one. However, he did get one in the Dawn of the Duel arc of the series and it went a little bit like this. Legendary gods of Egypt, please hear my call. In the name of every pharaoh that came before, I now beseech thee. Awaken, mighty obelisk, and rid the sacred palace of this darkness. I summon obelisk the tormentor. Slifer the sky dragon, or in the Japanese, sky dragon of Osiris. First wielded by Strings in the series and then taken by Yugimoto, Slifer's illegal card text reads, The heavens twist and thunder roars, signalling the coming of this ancient creature and the dawn of true power. His legal card's effect reads, requires three tributes to normal summon, cannot be normal set. This card's normal summon cannot be negated. When normal summoned, cards and effects cannot be activated. Once per turn, during the end phase, if this card was special summoned, send it to the graveyard. Gains 1000 attack and defense for each card in your hand. If a monster is normal or special summoned to your opponent's field in attack position, that monster loses 2,000 attack. Then, if its attack has been reduced to zero as a result, destroy it. This card's English name is a funny old thing. A man by the name of Sam Murakami, who was the one in charge of the localization of the Yu-Gi-Oh cards at the time at Four Kids, decided to not name this card after its original Japanese name of Osiris, but to instead name it after a fellow Four Kids employee's last name. That man's name was Roger Slifer, and because of Yu-Gi-Oh, his name shall now live on forever in the form of a children's trading card game. And if you're a fan of Yu-Gi-Oh! The Abridged Series, that is why Slifer gets the nickname Slifer, the executive producer, because it's named after one of the staff members at 4Kids. I summon Slifer, the executive producer! Anyway, his Japanese name of Sky Dragon of Osiris is derived from the Egyptian deity of the same name known as Osiris. He was the god of life and death and as such, he served as the god of the afterlife. Weirdly enough, Slifer actually takes very little influence from his Egyptian god counterpart. As Osiris was typically depicted as a man with green skin, Slifer has red. One association you can make between the two is the fact that some people called Osiris the king of the living, so the fact that Slifer the Sky Dragon is able to weaken monsters summoned to the field to reduce them down to zero attack and destroy them as if sending them to like the afterlife or something, I guess you could make it a comparison with them too. Just like Obelisk, this card too is associated with a dorm at Dual Academy in the Yu-Gi-Oh! GX series. Slifer's dorm is Slifer Red. And unironically, since Kaiba created the school and Yugi was the one who wielded Slifer, he made it the lowest ranking with the least luxuries in the school. Which is kind of ironic because all of this is based on the Battle City arc of the series where the Egyptian gods were mainly used. And if you look at it like that, it was in fact Yugi who came first in that tournament, Marikishtar that came second, and Seto Kaiba that came third. However, Kaiba has placed the order in the opposite way, with Obelisk coming first, Ra coming second, and then Slifer coming third. So, yeah, I thought it was quite funny. Now, Slifer's illegal artwork is taken from Yu-Gi-Oh! Duelist Duel 113. Summon 
the Nightmare, from when this card was summoned. While its latest second alternate artwork is taken directly from the Dark Side of Dimensions movie. Slifer also inspired two counterparts, one being the Wicked God counterpart called the Wicked Eraser, and the other is a Sacred Beast counterpart called Uriah, Lord of Searing Flames. In fact, speaking of inspirations, very famously, Slifer and Yugi made a cameo appearance in a manga called Bobo Bo 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 Bo. In that, he emerged out of Bobo Bo's afro during chapter 104. Sadly, for the anime adaptation for this chapter, this bit was actually chained, since Toei, who produced the TV version of Bobo Bo, no longer had the rights to Yu Gi Oh anymore, so. Ah, uh, it's a bit of a shame. Still cool though. Finally, when Slifer attacks, his attack is called Thunder Force. While its effect that launches a weakening blast from its second mouth is given the name Summon Lightning Impact in the Japanese and Lightning Blast in the English dub. The Winged Dragon of Ra, known in the Japanese as Winged Divine Dragon of Ra. Wielded by Marek Ishtar in the series, Ra's illegal text reads, Spirits sing of a powerful creature that rules over all that is mystic. His legal card effect reads, Reads, cannot be special summoned, requires three tributes to normal summon, cannot be normal set. This card's normal summon cannot be negated. When normal summoned, other cards and effects cannot be activated. When this card is normal summoned, you can pay life points so that you only have 100 left. This card gains attack and defense equal to the amount of life points paid. You can pay 1000 life points, then target one monster on the field, destroy that target. The Winged Dragon of Ra directly takes his name from the ancient Egyptian god of the sun, Ra. Ra was believed to be the sun deity whose eye is in fact the very sun in our sky, meaning Ra would grant his light and warmth on all those that worshipped him. In stories of Ra in a human form, he is always depicted with golden skin and blue hair. Knowing all this, it is all reflected with the winged dragon of Ra's design. As in the anime, before Ra could be summoned, he starts out in his sphere mode, which is very reminiscent of the sun itself. As well, Ra has a golden colour scheme with a blue gem on its forehead, much like Ra's human form. Golden skin, blue hair. And we've said it for the other two, we might as well say it for this one as well. In the Duel Academy, in the Yu-Gi-Oh! GX series, there is a dorm dedicated to the Winged Dragon of Ra. It is the middle dorm, and that is Ra Yellow. And they get the, uh, the meh. They're all right, dormitories. Ironically, Marik Ishtar once said in the Yu-Gi-Oh! manga that the Winged Dragon of Ra was in fact the most powerful of all the gods. In fact, so much more so that it would be considered in another class entirely. This is even shown in the manga and the anime because it has an extra layer of protection, having you have to recite its summoning chant in order to get this monster to even be summoned. Now, I find this ironic, as this may be true in the anime and in the manga. However, in the real world, Ra on its own could be considered the weakest out of the three due to its heavy nerfing. However, though, to circumvent Ra's real world weaknesses, it does have some alternate forms that make it pretty strong. Its first is the Winged Dragon of Ra Sphere Mode, whose effect is it cannot be special summoned, requires three tributes from either side of the field to normal summon to that side of the field. It cannot be normal set. Then shift control of this card's owner during the end phase of the next turn. Cannot attack. Your opponent cannot target this card for attacks or by card effects. You can tribute this card, special summon one, the Winged Dragon of Ra from your hand or deck, ignoring its summoning conditions. And if you do, it's attack and defense become 4,000. Now, this effect is a reference between the duel between Marek and Mai Valentine, where Mai was able to steal and summon Ra to her side of the field. However, it emerged in its sphere mode due to Mai not knowing the ancient incantation to properly call out Ra. Wait, hold on. Have we not done the, the call out yet? Oh, man, it's like famous. Uh, yeah, well, uh, here we go. Great beast of the sky, please hear my cry. Transform thyself from orb of light and bring me victory in this fight. Envelop the desert with your glow and cast your rage upon my foe. Unlock your powers deep within so that together we may win. Appear in this shadow game as I call your name. Winged Dragon of Ra. Eh, there's a couple variations to this champ, but that's the one that Marek used anyway against Mai, so it's the most fitting one. Anyway, the effect of summoning this monster to the opponent's field and then shifting it to the other is a direct reference to what actually happened in that duel. Shifting over to Ra's second form, we have the Winged Dragon of Ra, Immortal Phoenix. 
Its effect is it cannot be normal summoned or set. It must be special summoned by its own effect and cannot be special summoned by other ways. If the Winged Dragon of Ra is sent from the field to the graveyard, while this card is in your graveyard, special summon this card. Cards and effects cannot be activated in response to this effect's activation. This card is unaffected by other card effects and you can pay 1,000 life points, send one monster on the field to the graveyard. Once per turn, during the end phase, send this card to the graveyard and if you do, special summon one, the Winged Dragon of Ra Sphere Mode from your hand, deck, or graveyard, ignoring its summoning conditions. Now, Immortal Phoenix is direct reference to the Egyptian god Phoenix form Marik made the Winged Dragon of Ra take in his duels. In this form, it gained the ability to destroy all monsters on the opponent's side of the field when it was summoned. As well, when it battled a monster, Marik could pay 1,000 life points in order to guarantee its destruction. The coolest thing about this card has to be its effect that it is completely unaffected by other card effects, which in my eyes really cements the Winged Dragon of Ra and Immortal Phoenix as one of the true forms of the Egyptian gods in the real world, making it uh, a scary monster to have on the field. In fact, while we're at it as well, we might as well mention that Ra has two counterparts. A wicked god counterpart called the Wicked Avatar, which takes its appearance from its sphere mode. It also has a sacred beast counterpart called Haman, Lord of Striking Thunder. And as a side note as well, Horus the Black Flame Dragon level 8 is almost identical this card in terms of appearance, albeit it is more silver rather than gold. A simple explanation to this is that Horus is named after an Egyptian god as well. In fact, there are a lot of Egyptian god cards in the Yu-Gi-Oh card game that aren't technically a part of this series. We'll just quickly blast through them all right now. We've got the Horus level monsters, uh, all of the Hieratic monsters, all of the New Order monsters, Mystical Beast of Sir Ket, Sebex Blessing, Embodiment of Apophis, Ma'at, and uh, Sacred Phoenix of Nephis. They all have names that are associated with Egyptian gods. Anyway, lastly, the Winged Dragon of Ra's attack name in the anime and manga is called God Blaze Cannon, and its ability to instantly attack the turn it is summoned from the grave is fittingly named Instant Attack. As well, its effect to transfer all but one life point into the monster is called Point to Point Transfer. Holokati, the creator of light, known in the Japanese as Horokafi, the creator god of light. Its effect is it cannot be normal summoned or set. It must be special summoned from your hand by tributing three monsters whose original names are Slife of the Sky Dragon, Obis the Tormentor, and the Winged Dragon of Ra. This card's special summon cannot be negated. The player that special summons this card wins the duel. Now this monster is the fusion of all three of the Egyptian gods, and it made its debut in the final battle against the ultimate evil Zork Necrophades. Cited as the most powerful god in all existence in the Yu-Gi-Oh series, this card is so powerful in fact that they still haven't released it as an international version. God damn it, when are we going to get this card? It's awesome. Its Japanese name of Horokafi is taken from the Egyptian title of Ra Horokafi, which was created to show the link between Ra and Horus, since they were both gods of the sun, and as such they created the title to express how the sun journeys from one horizon to the next. So, from Ra to Horus. Since this card is a fusion of three divine beast type monsters, it was given a new typing completely unique to this monster. It is a divine creator god type monster. Just like all of the other Egyptian gods, Horokafi 2 has a sacred beast counterpart in the form of Armatile the Chaos Phantom, which too uses its sacred beast monsters in order to summon it. Horokafi's ability to give the user an instant win as soon as it is summoned is not not an easy task to accomplish in the Yu-Gi-Oh card game. In fact, I made a top 10 about just this subject, and if you'd like to see where Horokafi came on that list, you should check it out after this one. Why not? Finally, in the Egyptian God series, there are three support cards. Ra's Disciple, whose effect is when this card is summoned, you can special summon up to two Ra's Disciples from your hand and or deck. It cannot be tributed except for the tribute summon of Slife of the Sky Dragon, Oblis the Tormentor, and the Winged Dragon of Ra. You cannot special summon monsters except by the effect of Ra's Disciple. We also have Mound of the Bound Creator, a field spell with the effect level 10 or higher monsters on the field cannot be targeted or destroyed by card effects. If a level 10 or 
higher monster on the field destroys a monster by battle and sends it to the graveyard, the player who controlled the destroyed monster takes 1000 damage. When this card on the field is destroyed by a card effect and sent to the graveyard, you can add one divine monster from your deck to your hand. And the final support card is the true name. That's effect is declare one card name, excavate the top card of your deck, and if it is the declared card, add it to your hand. Then you can add to your hand or special summon one divine monster from your deck. Otherwise, send it to the graveyard. You can only activate one, the true name, per turn. And with that, guys, that is all of the Egyptian gods done. 